I hope everybody had a, a nice lunch. I think we're going to try a second time now. Shh, thank you. I think after my uh, missed first opportunity to start off our uh, session two, I think we'll go now to the real session two. If somebody could stick their heads out the back doors and just ask if anyone else out there wants to come in and then we can close those doors. So we're entering now the, uh, um, the second session, which is clinical and research update on NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. And as I said, unfortunately for the people who, who were here before, um, we have some really spectacular speakers today, world experts in, in both research and clinical care for neurofibromatosis. Um, our, we're going to do a, a little bit of a reversal where Dr. Ulrich, um, who's listed second in the program, is going to start us off. Just thematically, it's going to work better. Um, and um, Dr. Ulrich uh, is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School uh, and an integral part of the team at Boston Children's Hospital where she runs the research program there. Um, she's a close colleague of ours and I have the fortune of getting to work with her on an ongoing basis. Um, she it really spearheads a lot of the clinical trials uh, and other research projects in NF, and so she's a very appropriate person uh, to give us a talk on understanding clinical trials, 10 questions to ask before enrolling. Dr. Ulrich? Are you going to want a laser? Do you want a laser? So welcome. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to come. And as Dr. Plotkin said, we thought it might be better to put things into context by thinking about clinical trials in general before you hear the specifics of what clinical trials are available currently in NF1 and NF2. And so um, I tried to put together a list of my top 10 questions, although you can see from my title, it's actually hard to condense it down to 10. So. Um, this came into very close perspective for me when I was with a parent recently as they were consenting for a clinical trial. And I got to think about what questions I had as a family member rather than as a physician and tried to condense that down for you when you're thinking about uh, what opportunities might be available for you moving forward. So I think it's good to start with what the goals are and what is our goal when, we're, when as physicians and researchers when we're trying to come up with new treatments for NF. So our goal is to identify treatments that are well tolerated while excluding things that are toxic. And I think this is a situation where treating patients who have neurofibromatosis is very different from treating a patient who has terminal cancer. And we are not willing to tolerate the same toxicities that you might if there were no other treatments that are available. And also we need to demonstrate the benefit. And the benefit might be something like improved survival. It might be improved function or better use of an arm or a leg or better vision or better hearing. And in, more importantly, improved quality of life. So how do these benefits translate into a better existence on a day-to-day -day basis? And the alternative is to pr prove that the drug doesn't work and then we get it out of consideration. So to put that in perspective, question number one, what is a clinical trial and why do we do them in the first place? So clinical trials are the way that we take the advances in the laboratory and translate them into targeted therapies and novel treatment trials. And why is that important? That's because if we didn't have a clinical trial, then everybody would be individually taking little bits and drugs and not treating patients in the same way and we wouldn't be able to get that same amount of information. So the National Institutes of Health actually has a definition and I think that's a good place to start. A clinical trial is a prospective biomedical or behavioral research study of human subjects that's designed to answer specific questions about biomedical or behavioral interventions. That could be a drug, a treatment, a device, a new way of using a drug, a treatment, or a device. A clinical trial is a people-based study, so we don't really do clinical trials on animals, although much of the information that we get when we're thinking about developing a clinical trial comes directly from the lab. And clinical trials really shows up shows us what works and what doesn't work in medicine. And ultimately, we hope that clinical trials will result in better treatments for our patients. So why do we do them in the first place? Well, we need to do them to see whether or not a new dr drug or device is safe, and we use it to compare existing treatments and determine which one is better. We also learn how to use the treatment in a different population, such as children or persons with NF, because we know that just because a drug has been used in one tumor type before doesn't mean that it's going to work in patients who have NF. 
And doctors who are in charge of a clinical, clinical trial don't know ahead of time how things will turn out. If we knew how it would turn out, we never would have to do the trial in the first place. So the first clinical trials really date back, they think, as far uh, ago as the late 1700s, but they weren't widely used until the middle of the 20th century. Um, progress has been slow, and I think that's one thing that we hear from you a lot of the time. And it's important to recognize that there are a lot of steps that go into making a clinical trial. So the FDA has to approve new drugs and devices before they can be advertised or sold to the public. So what are the different kinds of clinical trials? So they include new treatment trials, so they test new treatments to see whether or not they're effective. Prevention trials, so can we give somebody a medication that will prevent a tumor from developing? Diagnostic trials, so how can we improve our ability to do MRI scans or different imaging techniques that will tell us more information? Screening trials to test the best way to detect certain diseases or health conditions. And quality of life trials that explore measures to improve comfort and quality of life with peop of people who have a serious medical condition. And most clinical trials that move forward now have some component to assess quality of life at the same time. So why does it take so long to come from mice to men? So potential drugs are discovered, purified, characterized, and tested in the labs before they reach a trial. And it's estimated that somewhere between 1,000 drugs are tested before a single one moves forward to a clinical trial. Could be even longer than that. And it also takes at least six years of research behind it in order to make it to that point. And then on average, it takes about eight years, average, I will say, from the time a cancer drug enters a clinical trial until it's approved. So this is a long period of time for that to happen. Ultimately, the biggest barrier is the shortage of participants. So despite the fact that there are many clinical trials available, fewer than five adult, patient, five adult patients with known cancer actually participate in clinical trials. And sometimes that's because they don't have access to them, and sometimes that's because they just decide not to participate. So question two, what phase is the clinical trial? And you may have heard this term before. So phase one is how much of the new treatment can be given with reasonable safety. This tells you nothing about whether or not the drug works before. The only goal of a phase one study is to see whether or not it's safe and to test doses until you find the good dose to use. So <clears throat> you want to know how often does it need to be given, how much of it needs to be given, and what are the side effects. Typically, this is the uh, done as a phase one trial when it's the first time it's been tested in humans or it's the first time it's been tested in a new patient population. You may get some hint of how the drug works, but ultimately the only goal is to assess side effects. Yep. The phase two is does the new treatment actually work? So the goal is to continue to gather information about safety to test whether or not the drug works in a specific patient population, and to continue to assess or develop markers that predict whether or not it works. In most, con in most situations, if you get a positive result from a phase two trial, it moves on to what's called a phase three trial. And this is to discover whether or not the new treatment is better than the standard treatment. Usually it's done across multiple institutions, so we do phase two and phase clinical trials through the Clinical Trials Consortium for Neurofibromatosis. Often patients are assigned at random to two groups by chance, and they have an equal chance of getting into either group. If there is no known treatment, then the new treatment can be compared to another treatment or a placebo, and we often continue to assess safety at that same time. So to condense that down for you, a phase one trial is somewhere around 15 to 50 patients just to evaluate safety and find a dose. A phase two trial is 25 to 100 patients where you screen drugs, further evaluate safety, and the phase three trial is a large number of subjects where you really confirm that the drug is working. And then phase four is something that happens after um, post-market approval to see long-term safety data. So question number three, who should participate in a clinical trial? So the cartoon says, I just heard there's a drug in trials that may stop my cancer. Great, says the woman. Are you going to volunteer to participate for the trial? Of course not. Why would I do that? I wouldn't do that either. I sure hope they get some results soon. And that's an attitude that a lot of people have. They're interested in what's going on, but yet when it comes down to it, they don't want to be the ones to move forward and participate. So most clinical trials test therapies in, uh, test new therapies for persons with NF. 
So even though we may have some information about a particular drug, we don't know how patients with NF will respond. You also need to test things in a variety of people, different ages, races, ethnic groups, and genders. And some people decide to participate because they've tried all available options, which they either didn't work or um, which they were unable to tolerate. And other people participate because they want to contribute to the advancement of medical knowledge. In question number four, how are patients protected and what are the safety measures while they are on a trial or on study? So I'm going to talk about three different things. The first one of which is protocol review. Well, what is a protocol? Well, a protocol is really a recipe book for the, for the researchers. It is a detailed plan of exactly everything that needs to happen, all the tests that need to be done and the order that they need to be done in. And it's the study plan on which all clinical trials are based. It's basically designed to protect the safety of those who participate in the clinical trial, and we get audited to make sure we're following that recipe book closely. So participants are evaluated regularly to monitor their health as well as to monitor the safety and effectiveness of the treatment. And all of the protocols have to be approved by an IRB. So an IRB is not an inflatable rescue boat, as you see in the picture here. An IRB is, is called an institutional review board. And these are the directors or the people who are responsible for protecting patients and who review all the studies to make sure they meet all the safety requirements. It's made up of experts in the field, it's made up of scientists, and it's also made up of laypersons or non-medical people. The IRB has to decide whether or not the study is, um, has a basis in medical, ethical, and legal grounds and does it ensure the safety of the participants. And the IRB gets regular updates along the way to make sure that we're following the recipe book. So eligibility, is it the right fit? And I put Cinderella Slipper up here to remind me to tell you that not everybody is a good candidate for a clinical trial. So just because you have a plexiform neurofibroma or just because you have a vestibular schwannoma doesn't mean you're the perfect candidate for a clinical trial because every potential candidate has to meet a certain number of what we call eligibility requirements. If your risk is too high or you have other medical conditions, you may not be able to participate. So some examples might be that you have abnormal kidney function, abnormal heart function. Whether If you're pregnant, you can't participate. Um, you could be too old. You could be too young. There are often restrictions on how old you need to be before you can participate. And not everyone who applies for a clinical trial will be uh, accepted based on those eligibility re uh, requirements. So I thought I would also intersperse through my talk some myths that come about or questions that come about from patients. And myth number one, if I'm found ineligible for a clinical trial, I won't be able to participate in any other trials. So the fact is, is that every trial has its own eligibility requirements. So just because you don't qualify for one study doesn't mean that you won't qualify for another study. And safety monitoring. Often the study treatment has not been used in many people before, and it may be hard to predict what side effects. So any of you have sat down and gone through what a consent process is, you'll get a laundry list of potential different side effects. And what I tell people is that everything we put on our mouths, including Tylenol, including ibuprofen, has a lot of potential side effects. And if you looked up the side effect profile of Tylenol, you may never take it again because it has a lot of potential side effects. And so I think it's important to have a good relationship with the person who you're doing the consenting processes, ask a lot of questions, and understand carefully what the, the most frequent risks are and what the most dangerous risks are. The team may also do more tests and physical exams than might be done if you weren't taking part in the trial, meaning more blood tests, urine tests, and imaging studies, for example. So question five, this is a hard one. What should I know about the study? And I embedded in this one a lot of other questions that I think are important. You need to ask a lot of questions. Bring your list with you. So ask why the study is being done. Ask how the drug works and ask for the goal of the study. And if there are other studies that have used the same drug and if so, what are the results and what are the side effects? and ask if there is a placebo as one of the study treatments. Those are just some examples of questions to ask. So what is a placebo? So a placebo is indistinguishable in appearance from the study drug. So the goal is that nobody will know which one is the active study drug and which one is the placebo. They're usually made by the same company and they're made to look identical to one another. The placebo has, is an inactive pill, however. Some people call it a sugar pill. 
In clinical trials, experimental treatments are often compared to a placebo to ensure the effectiveness of the drug. In some studies, participants will receive a placebo instead of an active or experimental drug, although moving forward, very few NF trials involve a placebo. So myth, I will get a placebo instead of an experimental treatment. The fact is that placebos are rarely given in NF clinical trials, and the great, the great majority of treatments compare the standard treatment with new investigational drugs or treatments. If there is a chance of getting a placebo, that will be very clear to you in the informed consent. And if there's a chance of placebo, there's often a chance of receiving the investigational agent later, and that's a question that you should ask. So what is required? And this is really important because there are a lot of requirements and a lot of sometimes extra time and study and extra study visits that come. And for those of you that can't read it, it says, this is the perfect clinical trial for me. All I have to do is move to Siberia, become a citizen, learn the language, live in a yurt, and exist on moss and lichens. Great, I'll check the flights. So what kind of tests are required? As I mentioned, there's a recipe book that all the researchers have to follow that tells you exactly what has to be done. That often includes blood tests, urine tests, EKG, imaging studies, and sometimes some extra visits to the eye doctor, for example, or the dental clinic. In any case, it always involves more study visits. So I thought I would put up for you just an example of something that we would see in that protocol or recipe book. And this is just for one aspect of the study, looking at EKG assessments. And it tells you information about which cycle or which period of time you need to do it, which day of that cycle, and which time you need to do it. So for us, they can be very complicated to follow. And this is just an example of one of the tests. That's one of many that need to be monitored during the study. Um, every protocol is a little bit different depending on what the potential side effects are. It's clear from this study that um, concern about cardiac side effects was a big issue, and so that's why it was built into the protocol that way. So question seven, what are the costs of participating in a clinical trial? So there are a number of financial issues to consider. So who's going to pay for the treatment? Interestingly enough, a lot of the time it's a drug company or a treatment consortium that pays for the drug itself, but that doesn't mean that they pay for every aspect of your participation. Often the, the insurance company will pay the additional costs of participating in the trial, meaning that they pay for things that are called standard of care. They pay for things like imaging studies and extra monitoring. Generally speaking, most of the time you're not reimbursed for your participation. Um, I think questions come up in relationship to whether or not you have insurance and whether or not you'll still be able to participate. So myth, I will have to pay out of pocket for treatment in a clinical trial because my insurance won't cover experimental therapy. This question comes up a lot. The fact is, is that state and federal laws require insurance companies to cover the cost of participation in a quote unquote qualifying cancer research intervention protocol. So most of the things that we see in NF1 and NF2, which are tumor-directed uh, treatments, would qualify under that definition. Uh, individuals who participate, however, may have additional costs, and I think that's important to remember. So you may have the cost of deductibles related to your visits. You may have some co-pays. If there are additional medications that you have to take along the way, you may have to pay medication co-pays at the same time. Obviously, if you're driving, there's extra gas, there's extra parking. There are hidden extra costs of having to come in for extra clinic visits. And health insurance typically covers those costs, that, as I mentioned, that are considered standard of care or tests and treatments that would be done for standard treatment. Usually, we build into the study, as the um, folks who design the study, a little bit of extra money to uh, cover costs that aren't covered by the insurance company. Again, you might break the bank if it was a lot, but there are some uh, individual costs that might be able to cover extra imaging studies or things that aren't necessarily covered. And question eight, and this is an important one, how will the study affect my overall health care? So who will take care of me? So who will take care of me during this study? Um, I call myself an NFologist. So will my primary care physician or my primary NFologist still be involved in my care? Because sometimes when you participate in a clinical trial, you have a whole new set of doctors, nurses, clinical research assistants, and folks who are in charge of your care at that time. If I withdraw from the study or if I change studies, will my team change? 
And when the study is over, will the same nurses and doctors take care of me? And this is an important question. You know, there are some of us, I know Dr. Plotkin and myself, when we enter a patient on a clinical trial, we continue to follow them step by step through that clinical trial. But I think it's a little bit institution dependent, and not all folks who take care of patients who have NF also do clinical trials. So that may vary depending on where you're from and who your current team is. And also whether or not you're traveling to a new center to participate in a trial. So how will my health be affected? So how are the study treatments and procedures different than standard care? And will the study require that I be hospitalized? If so, for how long? Generally, most of the studies that we do don't require hospitalization. Um, it's important to know whether or not you can take your regular medications while you're on the study. And the reason is that some study drugs may have interactions. So they may be broken down in the liver or broken down in the kidney. And if you're on another medication, like a seizure medication, uh, that may interact with the study drug, you might have to change that medication to something else. It might affect the ability of birth control pills to work in the way that they're intended or other hormones, and so it's important to make sure that you're as forthcoming as possible with all the medications that you take, including all the supplements that you take, to make sure that there's no potential interactions. And also make sure you understand whether or not there are restricted foods or medications. Grapefruit's one that comes up all the time just because of the way that it's broken down in the liver, and it can interfe interfere with a lot of medications. And then the last one is, if I enroll in the study, will I be able to find out my results? Um, eventually, that answer is yes. Usually along the way, while the study is being conducted, the answer is no. If someone else in the study has an unexpected and severe health problem, will I be told? So as folks who um, design clinical trials, we get consistent updates from the drug companies and pharmaceutical companies as to new and severe or unexpected side effects. And sometimes we are required by our IRB to actually make changes to the consent and update our, we have to determine whether or not there's a significant enough risk that we need to let our patients know. Be sure that if we determine that there is such a risk, we would communicate that to you directly, and it's a requirement of our IRB. Will I need to keep getting tests done after I stop taking the study drug? So sometimes ongoing monitoring is required even after you ta finish taking the medication. That may defo be to follow up on kidney function or liver function or just check in to make sure any side effects are resolved. And then where will I be treated if I participate in the study? Well, not everyone across the country, not every site across the country has clinical trials available to them, so it may require some travel to a site where the study is open. And what happens if I withdraw from the study? The hands going up are to remind me to tell you that participating in a clinical trial is voluntary. And that's important to remember. You can withdraw at any time. And so I always tell my patients, you can change your mind at any time. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be 30 days from now or 90 days from now, and I will always be your doctor. It will not affect your care moving forward. People often ask, if I withdraw, will I continue to be cared for by the same healthcare team? Well, the study team will continue to follow you at least for a short period of time to make sure any effects or side effects have resolved. And it's important to remember that when you sign your consent, most of the time you sign your consent to have your data used moving forward unless you withdraw that permission. So unless you specifically go back to the team and say, I don't want any of my scans, images, blood tests, or anything to be used, that information that has already been collected will be used moving forward. And then can I switch from one trial to another? Um, the answer is yes, but you may need to wait usually somewhere around 30 days or so before starting a new clinical trial using a new investigational agent, and you also have to meet all of the eligibility requirements for that new trial. And then question 10, what are the potential risks and benefits, or what is the best I could hope for? So the FDA works hard to make sure that people who participate in clinical trials are protected. They make great efforts to control the risks, although some of them are unavoidable, and some of them we just don't know about them until we do the trial itself. All participants have to sign what's called an informed consent before joining any study to indicate that they understand that the trial is research and that they can leave the trial at any time. It also ensures that participants know what potential risks are, are ahead. 
So um, there are potential for different kinds of risks. So there's a physical risk, meaning that there may be an unpleasant, serious, or unknown risk associated with the clinical trial, and the treatment may not be effective. They, we know that there are potential for financial risks. Um, there is some potential for privacy risks, although you all should know that when you participate in a clinical trial, everything that leaves your institution is coded. So you might be known as 007FJ, um, but you will always be known as that study number or study um, code. Nobody will know who you are. There are always people who can come in and audit our records and audit our recipe book to make sure we're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing, but everything that leaves and everything that's analyzed will always have that 007FJ on it. There are also logistical uh, risks, which I think are important. It's not always convenient, and it may require more time and attention, more visits, and additional tests or more treatment than is typical. So what are the potential benefits of participating? And the guy on the couch says, doctors suggest two glasses of wine a day has health benefits. <laughs> so the potential benefits are that you get actively involved in medical care and that you gain access to potentially new research treatments before they're widely available. They increase the treatment options that are available to you. You obtain expert medical care at leading healthcare institutions. I think it's important also to remember that the trial may or may not benefit you specifically, but we hope that it moves the field of NF research forward. Clinical trials are an opportunity, and I think they should be seen as such. They are the leading edge of science. They're, they involve a dedicated team of investigators and care providers, and they help others by contributing to medical research. So I thought I would close by um, leading you forward down the path a little bit of how can I decide if entering a clinical trial is right for me. So my recommendations to you are to bring a trusted family member or friend with you. Uh, bring a list of questions. I know that even for me going to the doctor, I feel like I have all these questions in my head and then the minute I sit down in the chair, I've forgotten all of them. So writing them down ahead of time and bringing a book with you and bringing a second person to hear all that information is incredibly helpful. You need to find out what the study involves and what other options are available. It's also maybe helpful to meet with a financial counselor at the study site. And if English is not your first language, I strongly recommend that you use a professional medical interpreter. Don't rely on a family member to interpret for you. If you're feeling pressured, you, can, you should discuss your options. So you can choose spiritual leaders, friends, healthcare team members, psychologists, or support group members. And remember that you don't have to take part in research. Participation is voluntary. And you shouldn't take part in a trial unless you feel that it's right for you. Questions to ask yourself. Am I able to make the extra trips to the doctor or the hospital that might be needed for the study? Do I have family or friends who can help me? Do I feel comfortable receiving a treatment whose risks and benefits are somewhat unknown? Would any of the possible side effects be intolerable for me in any way? And will I be able to manage it if it means missing more work or school? And lastly, and probably most importantly, Am I making this decision for me or my child and not to please someone else? And then I thought I would close by a couple of final thoughts related to paying it forward. These are written by two patients at Dana-Farber. I know there are many people who participated in clinical trials before I came along, and it was because of their participation that researchers were able to create a new combination of drugs available to me. It made me feel like I was part of a much bigger world of people trying to make the patient experience better. And then the second one, I felt that if there was a success with the clinical trial, I would be fortunate and medical science would benefit. But even if I didn't have success, medical science would still benefit. So I think I'll close with that and take any questions.